Hello, I'm Andy Tattersall and welcome to this podcast on how to write more, how to be productive with your writing. It's a second podcast which goes along with one that I've created around how to beat digital distraction. And uh, so this one will focus on the issue of writing and hopefully will help you be more productive with your writing and get things done. So anyone uh, working in academia will know that writing is core to what you do. And at some point in your career, there will be times when it's hard to get words down on paper, especially um, um, when there are deadlines looming. So hopefully this this will help. And the first thing we're going to look at is the idea of eating a frog. Now, this might sound quite a, uh, uh, a rather horrible thing to do, and I'm not condoning that you go and eat a live frog for a moment, but it's an idea that's based on a quote by Mark Twain, where he said, eat a live frog every morning and nothing worse will happen to you for the rest of the day. The premise is that we all have tasks that we don't look forward to completing, and writing can form part of that reluctance. So if you have a paper or part of your thesis to write, you can keep uh, actively putting it off. Uh, then you're just going to generate yourself anxiety. And that's going to get worse as your deadline looms ever nearer. So rather than deal with the smaller, easier tasks at the start of the day, actually start out by working on your writing task first thing. It might seem a bit hard and it might feel like when you eat a meal, it's always easier to eat the nicer ingredients and the nicer parts of our meal on the plate. But this is a case of starting with the, the less juicier pieces. But I guarantee if you tackle that writing task, first thing, you're going to feel a great sense of relief, accomplishment and pride for the rest of the day. And psychologically, that will be beneficial to you. It takes willpower and it takes effort, but trust me, it will be easier than eating an actual frog and you will get a step nearer to your actual writing goal. So let's talk about the issue of writer's block. And at some point of your academic career, you're going to find yourself uh, hitting a wall and struggling to get words onto paper. And don't worry, it happens to the very best of writers. And there are many reasons for this. It might be that you've got other issues going on, such as you're feeling ill or personal circumstances that need your attention. There are certain times when you just have to leave your writing for that day and return to it when you're in a better place. For the majority of writer's block issues, though, uh, there's often a solution that can be found, and I'm going to give you a few, hopefully. Firstly, if you're being distracted, you need to address that distraction and remove it. If that distraction is your office and other people, you could try asking them to be quiet. You could wear headphones or maybe go work in another place. Whilst you tackle that writing problem, um, then you can focus on it. So I've created a short series of videos on digital distraction that could help you if your distraction comes uh, from technology such as email and social media. If you do a search for Shar Vids, S-C-H-A-R-R-V-I-D-S, Shar um, Sharvid, you will find us on uh, YouTube and the videos will be on there. Um, the second reason might be that you really do not know what to write about and you're just lacking confidence. And a good thing to do is have a discussion with those who can help you, like your colleagues, or if you're doing a PhD, your supervisor. A fresh piece of eyes on a piece of work might be all it takes to get you over that hurdle. The next problem might be as simple as you're just missing key knowledge to your argument. So the first thing to do is seek out that knowledge and pay a visit to your library. That's the best place to start. Um, speak to a librarian and discover if there are any useful databases or resources that can help you get that valuable information. Writing at times can feel um, too easy and you can end up with just pages and pages of scribbled notes, which is obviously the opposite of writer's block. But you also then may start to feel a bit of an anxiety because the ideas perhaps start to feel half formed. So the best way around this is to structure your writing and put in headings and subheadings, preferably before you start. Uh, this leads on to my next tip, which is if you start putting in these headings uh, and work from there, this will stop you writing too much in one section and having the terrible problem of having to back, cut back on the text afterwards, which can be as, as problematic as actually writing it in the first place. Once you put your headings and subheadings in, you can start to fill out the areas with the text. 
Now there is a saying out there that you cannot see the wood for the trees and by creating this framework with headings you create paths through what would have been a very dense forest of words that you can easily get lost in. The next tip will help you if you're struggling to get your writing project off the ground. If you're truly struck with write, stuck with writing those very first words, uh, if you're really struggling to generate any kind of text on a topic, then consider creating a mind map. And mind maps are really very useful and they're very easy to make. And there are plenty of resources out there that can help you. Lots of websites, lots of tools. But really all you need is just a pencil and a very big sheet of plain paper. Start with your central idea and from from scratch and then start to branch off it. So, for example, your question might be, is the internet democratic? From your central kind of uh, bubble, you can start to branch off into topics like fake news or trolls or political activism, freedom of speech, so on and so forth. From each of these branches, you can then start to expand outwards into other related strands. And before you know it, you will have a collection of headings and subheadings from which you can write. If your problem is that you have way too many ideas, then you need to shelve some until you have the time to properly address them. If you try and tackle too many ideas at the same time, you're going to run the risk of creating half-finished work or just get yourself tangled up in a theoretical mess. Remember that each idea you try and work on could spore further ideas and therefore more distraction from your core writing task. Ensure you don't overstretch yourself make a note of those ideas and work through them systematically at the appropriate time. Chances are you may go back to some of those ideas and realise they were not that good in the first place. So it's good to actually kind of go back and revisit some of these rather than start to work on them straight away. Whatever you do, pace yourself and take time to think about your writing. With proper support in research, the words will start to flow. So let's think about being strategic with your writing and how you actually tackle the issue of writing productivity. As I mentioned, um, you should always try and tackle certain writing tasks first thing in the morning and do something uh, that can be say, referred to as eating a frog. But um, if the morning doesn't work for you, then you should put time aside in your day to go somewhere and do nothing but write at a time that works for you. That might be the evening. Again, everyone has different commitments and they may be external to your actual research so you have to kind of fit around that remember that writing doesn't have to be a solitary pursuit and um, it helps maybe if you pair it with a fellow writer and set yourself targets to achieve in a writing session now obviously if you're a student this is not about you colluding on the same piece of work um, that's, that's certainly not the way to do things. It's about actually offering a buddy system where you can both write on separate writing projects but just be there for each other to make sure that you're actually carrying it out. You can go even further by forming your own writing support group and meet up every week or, or so for a couple of hours to write. All it needs is to find a suitable location, like a library, and we've got obviously several of these spaces in the University of Sheffield that you can go and write, and set time to start and finish the actual kind of writing project. Set yourself house rules and ensure everyone abides by them. And the Pomodoro technique is a great way to help you with your strategic writing and works on the idea of writing for set periods of time with enforced breaks. So, for example, you have... Um, to write for say 25 minutes and then you have a five minute break and you perhaps would repeat this four times before taking a longer break to have lunch it depends what works for you and what you agree with other writers it may be you have two 25 minute chunks and then a 10 minute break and then two 25 minute chunks and then a 10 minute break but it's the breaks are essential they're important as it may feel like you're in a flow and actually um if you have a break, you're going to lose that flow. But the reality is that flow is going to stop at some point, and it's good to have these periodical breaks. The enforced breaks give you a little more time to relax and reflect before getting back on the task of writing. If you're writing as part of a group, it is essential that one of you ensures the rest of the group have a break. And the Pomodoro chunks uh, can be longer or shorter than 25 minutes, but I would suggest 25 minutes is the optimum time setting. And I guarantee that if you do complete seven or eight Pomodoro successfully, you will be surprised by how much you've managed to write in that time. 
If you're really keen, you can form a small group of fellow writers and suggest setting up a writing boot camp. So as part of a writing boot camp, what you would do is, is you would block out a good chunk of the day, say five hours to run eight Pomodoros with five minute breaks and a one hour lunch break. You can also use it to actually just support that writing strategy and just make the whole day a little less scary than it sounds. You know, boot camp does sound scary, but it is the idea of just coming and getting things done. And I've run several writing boot camps and everyone who comes really enjoys them and takes away lots of written text that they may not have actually kind of got started or finished or certainly would have taken a lot longer to write in other settings. Finally, one thing you can try and do to be more strategic with your writing is always carry a notebook, and that can be a paper or electronic one, but think about times when you've had ideas or a solution to a problem. Uh, in addition to those times when someone has imparted some useful knowledge, you can, of course, take notes on your smartphone, but also taking, uh, using note-taking tools like Evernote can be really useful, while a pen and notepad will always be an effective way to capture down such information. It's about creating those small habit changing processes that in time will make you a more effective writer. So I want to talk about also now the idea of making a mess and rewarding yourself and the idea of how you use that within productive writing. And one of the problems uh, with trying to write, especially in an academic setting, is you often fall into that trap of trying to write the finished article in the very first draft. The reality is that no first draft is ever the finished article and it can lead to a lot of anxiety to get those first few right words down absolutely right. But the very first few words do not have to be the very first few words of the article. So don't feel compelled to start at the very beginning. When writing, there is no other critics apart from yourself. So you're totally free to make a mess and then tidy it up afterwards. That said, it's not an excuse to go off topic and write just anything just to get your word count up. Another technique is to try free writing and this is where you just use a pen and a paper and you start to get your ideas down without stopping. So don't stop to put in missing grammar and don't do any spell checking and just read back what you've written later. Don't actually stop to read things, just write. Ideally you should do this first thing in the morning before anything else you've written. It, because you're using a pen and paper it's the ideal opportunity to write before you turn your computer on. Once you've completed your writing session, you can then carry out your proofread and refine your work, preferably after you've taken a break to get a hot drink or a treat. And that leads me on to another thing that you should do when you're writing a lot, that you should always reward yourself. Forming writing habits can be hard, and if you give yourself rewards after completing certain milestones, then habits can be easier to form. It's up to you as to what rewards work best for you, but I wouldn't advise having a sweet treat after completing every sentence. Another thing you can do is set yourself false deadlines and try and trick yourself into completing work that little bit earlier. I, if I have to deliver a lecture or a talk and need uh, to update my, my slides, I always put in a, a reminder in my calendar weeks before the actual event, so I'm not completing tasks really close to the deadline. Obviously, it doesn't always work that way, but quite often I can get things nudged early, um, which can be quite, quite good um, in terms of sort of like morale. A way that you can do that is to create yourself a productivity and deadlines calendar and tools like Google Calendar are really good for creating multiple private calendars that only you can see. So your daily private calendar could tell you to eat a frog first thing in the morning, it could tell you to take time out to do some reading, reading. it could tell you to take time out when you need to write, it may tell you time to have your lunch, take a break, meditate, do those kind of things just to remind you, you don't have to adhere to that calendar each day but it's a daily reminder to be, just be that more strategic when you're actually writing and with your time. Let's move on to the idea of referencing. And this is something that hopefully you all do listening to this podcast, but I know not everybody does do. I want you to kind of think about how you reference and what you do. So whenever you're writing anything substantial like a report, a thesis or a journal paper, it's essential you use a reference management tool. And after you've conducted your literature search and collected multiple sources to support your hypothesis, it's better to have them in an ordered system rather than a collection of loosely connected documents. So tools like EndNote, um, Mendeley, Zotero, ReadCube, CiteUlike are all very good at organising and storing your supporting literature. 
There are two main reasons why you should do this. Firstly, it will save you the effort of manually creating a bibliography at the end of your project. If you're submitting to a journal and are rejected, then the reference management package can change your reference list to the style and format of another journal with just the click of a button. It also means that you have your supporting literature saved in one place should you write about the same topic for another piece of research and need to add fresh citations following an updated literature review. Um, one problem that academic writers have when working on a piece of research is deciding where in their work to cite the supporting research and sometimes it's not so straightforward and you can find yourself going around in circles trying to decide where the best place to cite a piece of work. A solution to do this is use a matrix like the one used by the thesis whisperer Inga Newburn. who I suggest you look at Inga Newburn's um, website and just do a search for the thesis whisperer. You simply deconstruct your piece of research down into its composite parts, very much like creating a mind map but backwards. From there, look at each piece of your supporting literature, um, what they've written in relation to the, each piece of your paper. Find out the key arguments from the supporting literature and align them to the key arguments in your own writing. This kind of technique can, acquire, uh, can require additional labour on your part but it's a worthwhile exercise if you're struggling to supplement your research with appropriate references. In the end, it could highlight that you are just trying to cite research that is not really anything to do with your own work. But whatever you do, don't try and fit square pegs into round holes. So let's talk about um, taking notes. Those who take note finding do find it a useful exercise, only if it's to reinforce ideas by the simple process of writing them down. However, it does help a lot uh, of students and academics to revisit lectures, seminars, conferences and refer to afterwards. If traditional note taking works well for you then that's great but there are a few things you could do to improve on it. Firstly if you are a traditional book and pen note keeper you could try the Cornell note taking system and this system works by dividing your page into four spaces. At the top of, of the page is the title and date whilst you draw a line about a quarter of the way up from the bottom of the page and this will run horizontally and that will be a summary of your notes on that page. On the left hand side you will draw a line between the title and the summary sections so that will be about a third of the way in and uh, on the right hand side of that line is the main body of the page and this is where you form your key notes and your, your key thoughts. Uh, if possible use abbreviations as well. Back to the left hand side where you've drawn that line, that is where you will write corresponding keywords and questions in relation to the main body of your text. And this just basically gives you some kind of like context. It's almost like putting metadata into your writing so you actually can start to understand, oh, this is what I meant by this. Or if you're trying to find notes, those keywords will allow you to actually find particular notes. And this is really useful if you do take a lot of notes. If you're more technology focused then there are loads of tools out there you can use like Evernote and that remains a brilliant tool for capturing uh, notes in addition to recording audio such as a lecture. That said it's essential that you ask permission of the person who is um, delivering the actual lecture. In Evernote you can take web clippings and store photos, PDFs and other artifacts and it's essential you decide which two devices you use with Evernote as that's what you're limited to with the free version. If you want to get more out of the software, you'll have to pay for a premium version. And there are other useful uh, note-taking tools out there. Um, and a couple of the better ones are Good Notes for Apple devices and Lecture Notes for Android devices. If you are more of a Post-it kind of person, uh, then you might want to use Post-it note type tools like Padlet or Google Keep, which are excellent for keeping short notes and web links. So hopefully this has been a helpful podcast for you in terms of getting more out of your writing and being more productive and more strategic with your writing. And uh, as I say, there are more videos out there. If you do a search uh, for Shah Vids, uh, because I work in the School of Health and Related Research, which is Shah, and my name is Andy Tatsall, uh, Information Specialist at the School of Health and Related Research, and hopefully this has been useful for you in your writing, and good luck with your writing projects.